Hey, y'all. Welcome. Welcome back to Interstage Window, my Saturday stream, which is a stream with my friends. And today I have with me Landon. Say hi, Landon. Hi, Landon. Oh, my gosh. Okay, Today's Landon. stream is brought to you by Cough Drops. <laughs> yes. Am- okay. Before we go farther, we do have to address why Landon's voice sounds like that. So, Landon, please tell everybody what's going on. <laughs> I have the sick. I don't know what kind of sick it is. It might be COVID. Gotta gotta take that test. I'm getting one delivered at some point. Uh, and it might also just be a cold because that's kind of what we're living with in this day and age. But when you work with as many children who don't know how to wash their hands as I do, uh, you end up feeling like this around once a month, if not once every other month. And this time it just happens to fall on a Saturday. The tridemic is real, y'all. Landon it's caught so the, the tridemic. <laughs> so uh, excuse the crackly voice and whatever this appears like on your uh, screen. Actually, I think but- your, on, on the, your look, I don't think gives it away. Honestly, I think it's just the voice. Uh, I appreciate you saying that. I just keep looking at the Zoom <laughs> version of me and I go, wow, she's really playing like the death part of the death goddess. <laughs> oh my Laying gosh. <laughs> Welcome in, Rara. Hello. How's it going? Hello. Um, Rara says, I'm sorry, Landon. I'm sorry too. Uh, Landon messages me this morning and she goes, I'm feeling really sick today. Sorry if the stream ends up being low energy. And I said, that's okay, because we're talking about the state of the Harry Potter fandom. So maybe we're just like sick of talking about Harry Potter. Maybe it's like, it's like all, it'll all come around. (laughs) I'm just like, I'm tired of this being my personality. And obviously, so is my body. (laughs) Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Landon's body said, time to, um, to show, not tell in our story (laughs) of interstage window. (laughs) That's where we're at. Love it. Yes, yes. So, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry that you're sick. But um, I also want to say at the start, before we get into anything, Merry Christmas, everybody. This is our Christmas episode. I hope you're enjoying the Christmas manicure, the Christmas eyeshadow. Like I went a little bit extra Christmas today. Um, So very, very excited. And uh, as you guys know, and we're probably going to say this a couple of times this weekend, but after this weekend, like I'm streaming today and tomorrow, we're going to take our Christmas break. So we won't be back. The next stream that we will come back to will be on uh, January 7th. So if you're wondering where I am, I'm having a fuck ton of fun at Disney on Christmas. That's where I am. (laughs) And I'm uh drinking martinis on my way to uh either bonaire carousel or aruba so on a cruise yeah so we have to send landon really good vibes that one this is not covid and two she gets better over the course of the next week so that she can go on her cruise please yes Yes, Rara. merry chrysler merry chrysler everybody and Christmas is secular, so it's okay to say Merry Christmas or Happy Holidays or literally anything you want in yeah. the stream. You can say any holiday greeting. All of them are, are okay. Happy Yule. <laughs> yes, that one's fine too. Happy Yule. That's um, what if I'm we have for. any Yeah, if we have any Jewish peoples, Happy Hanukkah. I think Hanukkah call, falls over Christmas this year, right? I think that's mm. right. You'll correct me if I'm wrong. No. I Did we already have over. it? Yeah. We already had it. Okay. I will double check. I never, I can never keep up um, with because uh, the calendars are different. But uh, yeah, happy belated for the. Uh, oh yeah, it actually it's Hanukkah right now. Or okay. so Hanukkah? No, I lied. Hanukkah starts tomorrow. Starts tomorrow. You're okay. Right. Okay. <laughs> Woo. Okay. Well, uh, happy Hanukkah then as well for all of those things. Um, so I think that was all the the pre stuff, right, Landon? So I'll get into our yes. little disclaimers and things. Okay. So today we are going to be talking about the state of the Harry Potter fandom. So this is going to be kind of like our end cap episode of the year and a half that we've been going through all of the Harry Potter stuff. We know that we owe you guys a Fantastic Beast stream that we didn't, you know, we ended up skipping. We are going to do that in early January next year. So please stay tuned for that. But this really is kind of like our, um, our culmination of, of all of our Harry Potter stuff. So this is, this is, um, this is our epilogue. I promise it will be better than the real epilogue. (laughs) Um, and, uh, not and hard as, to be <laughs> true. And as always, of course, uh, this is not a spoiler free, a uh, show. So spoilers for anything and everything wizarding world. If there's literally any Harry Potter stuff that you are worried about being spoiled on, 
this is not the episode for you. So see you later. Goodbye. Um, and then the other disclaimer that we always like to say is that we do not condone, support anything. J.K. Rowling's abhorrent political views. So, um, you know, we are we are part of the queer community ourselves. Landon has talked about that. I have talked about some gender stuff before. So, um, you know, we don't support that. And uh, and we do appreciate that any money that you would give to us today, if you really feel compelled to do that, another great thing to do instead would be to give to the Trevor Project or whatever your favorite um, trans inclusive uh, nonprofit is. So that's OK to do today. <clears throat> Yes, uh, especially this time of year, trans youth and LGBTQ youth uh, being home for the holidays is really, really hard for them. Um, and so being able to reach out to support in any way that you can monetarily, but also a lot of us have breaks coming up. So there's always uh, resources and places that you can volunteer your time at if you are willing and able. Absolutely. And welcome in Sparta, Chris. It's been a second since I've seen you. Uh, so I hope you're doing well. Merry Christmas and congratulations on the first today, friend. Um, so yeah, so yeah, we're going to, that's what we're going to talk about today. So um, we have been, gosh, it has literally been a year and a half, right? We started yeah. summer of 2021, deciding that we were going to re-go through all the Harry Potter content as adults, right? Yeah, I think uh, I think I kind of want to talk about the story a little bit before that, though, too, mm. because I had a Harry Potter podcast where I actively talked about the Harry Potter uh, books and that kind of fell apart. That was prior to me doing Enter Stage Window. Um, and then for about the first year of Enter Stage Window, maybe nine months, we were very much like, no, we don't want to talk about Harry Potter. We don't want to mention Harry Potter. Uh, death of the author sort of thing. We're not going to give any time or a platform for it. Um, and then I think you came to me and you were like, hey, what if we did? What if we did do this thing? Uh, because we had started talking about media and doing and doing deep dives into media. And Harry Potter just felt like an easy thing to do because... We both knew it. It wasn't a huge commitment. And it was something we could both talk about per fairly easily. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much for the um, tier three. Holy shit. Oh, my um, goodness. Sub Lunar. Oh, my God. Thank you so, so much. 27 months. Um, I love you so much. Thank you. <laughs> We're going to, we'll do a pin for you. I'll do a pin for you um, at the, at the break after we're done with kind of podcast segment. So don't let me forget. It's going to be pin time. Um, but yeah, so exactly. We, Landon and I, for those that don't recall, we have told this story before, but I think a brief version of it is appropriate for today. Landon and I really <clears throat> became friends because of both joining this Harry Potter Marauders era role play together. That wasn't yeah. how we met. We actually met through the Once Upon a Time fandom, funny enough. But um, but we really became friends um, over Harry Potter and both of us loving the Harry Potter world, but wanting to kind of um, having this desire to kind of play with our own characters. And Marauders Era lets you do that because most of the characters in Marauders Era really don't get much in the way of personality, right? Like we get Sirius <laughs> and Remus and Snape, but most of the other Marauders Era characters are either dead by the time the book starts, you only know them through the lens of other characters. Or they're mentioned in such brief passing that you really don't get to know them, right? I guess Alistair maybe is the only other one that you kind of get to know a little bit, right? Alistair Moody. Um, but yeah. so we we were both like, Marauders Era, yeah, this sounds like such a fun role play. Let's go do it. And we did it. Um, and we joined it together. And uh, and we made a ship together. And uh, and that's how we became like besties. <laughs> Talking every day sort of per people. Yes. Uh, and yeah, and then since then... Um, Harry Potter has had a really important impact on our friendship and something that prior to us do talking about him on the podcast, something we would pretty heavily debate and talk about. Um, again, we, we kind of talked about this in our intro to Harry Potter and, and what it means to us all of those months ago. Um, but for me, Harry Potter was such a huge marker of identity, uh, not only as a queer woman, but as someone growing up who was chronically lonely, who didn't feel like she had any friends and made most of her connections through fandom within Harry Potter, um, 
I had a huge soft spot in my place for Harry Potter and had been on the devastated side of things when JKR's turf tweets started surfacing. Um, and I know for you, Karen, like always having been the logic person, obviously was just as affected, but had also been like, yeah, that's what fucking happens to people when they have too much power and too much influence. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess also I, I had a, a enough years on you to yeah. have and, and been in the Harry Potter fandom. And like I was there whenever people were saying like, you know, J.K. Rowling's not as progressive as she pretends to be. Here's the examples of racism in her books. Here's the tokenization in her books. Um, I was in fandom whenever, I guess you could say, Blaze Zabini actually got a race and became Black and mm-hmm. saw the fandom's reaction to that. Um, you know, th- things of that nature that that I experienced uh, a little bit older than the age Landon was when those things were going on. And so I wasn't like super surprised, um, but I was very angry because from my perspective, J.K. Rowling had such goodwill built up that it was just so audacious to me that she felt the need to tweet this shit. Like, can't she just keep it to herself? Like, and I remember feeling like, so angry to find out that not only it, does she actually believe all the bigoted things that her haters claimed that she believed, but she felt the need to spread it and yeah. um, use those political opinions to actually try to affect change in the world. And like my image of her was just more chill than that. <laughs> But it started to be shattered, to be honest, whenever um, she came out with the uh, the Dumbledore was gay all along and I just never put it in the books, you know, that kind of bullshit. So I was starting to get tired of her around that time and the turf stuff was just like the extra little thing that turned that um, annoyance into anger. And so, yeah, um, and that, had all that happened, was my experience. <laughs> an important context that that had all happened pre our friendship. Mm-hmm. So that like pushing away and my denial was how we came into this friendship. So mm-hmm. it was always just an interesting dynamic that existed between us. And then as things amped up and got worse, um, obviously, uh, we had different reactions. Um, I was like, and then the tweets started. <laughs> and then the tweets started. And both of us, I remember both of us in the in the uh, group chat when uh, JKR announced that like wizards didn't need indoor plumbing and they just shit themselves. <laughs> um, I remember both our reactions for that one. And it was pretty much along the same lines of this is fucking stupid. This woman is obviously losing her goddamn mind. We're not going to pay any more attention to her. Yeah, I mean, uh, we were diff- at that point, um, pretty much everyone in our Harry Potter role play was like doing the Shisha Potter less joke like constantly. Yeah. <laughs> we were yes. just like let's ignore let's ignore the the crazy grandma over it here. <laughs> let's pretend it doesn't exist. We know how to write Harry Potter better. We are writing Harry Potter better so on and so forth. Um and so as we connected and started the show having the opportunity to talk about Harry Potter was I think a something that we could find interest in that could really help us change our show and the way that it is and the way that it was forming because at that point we had kind of both of us had taken a hiatus with Harry or we're starting to take a hiatus with RP uh we had kind of run out of topics to talk about so we were like <laughs> how are we going to transition to this next thing hey this is a thing that we know that our fandom or our our people like the people that watch us will enjoy something that we've talked about that we like uh, and in a fandom that we both exist in. So mm-hmm. it could be a, a natural transition. Yeah. And it did feel very natural. It did it feel did. very natural to switch over to media critique, starting with Harry Potter. Um, because we had both absorbed so much of it, it was a very... Uh, easy thing a fast thing like not fast to reread it because I'm a very slow reader but I mean that like as I'm rereading it the episode is like forming in my mind very very yeah. easily right like oh that we can do this point and this point and this point and this is important and da 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 you know um compared to maybe some other things that we've looked at and it was like okay what do we really have to say about this let's really talk it through whereas Harry Potter it's just 
it's very obvious what we have to say. But also going into it, we knew that there were things we wanted to talk about. We knew mm-hmm. we wanted to talk about Harry Potter's abuse. We knew we wanted to talk about the racism and transphobia that has been inside of the Harry Potter books since the very beginning. We knew we knew we were talking about it when we were like plotting this out that we were going to talk about uh the house elves and the concept of slavery and like good slavery within the Harry Potter world. We we because we were so connected with it, we already knew things. And so yes, it was a very interesting and easy transition uh for our content. And then it was also just something that I think was very fun for us to talk about. But I'm not sure at least for me, I didn't expect the change that it would bring and not necessarily eye-opening because everything I kind of already knew, but like just how my view would transition along with the way that our content was moving. Yeah. So like, I guess I went into it very sour grapes. Like um, I knew that I loved Harry Potter for reasons, but like it had I had been so angry at for so long and engaging only with the fandom and not with any canon material for so long that um that like I went into it that way. And I I rediscovered why when I was younger I liked this world so much and I liked these characters so much. And like, you know, I really uh oh, we lost Landon's camera. Sorry. That's okay. Back, We're back. <laughs> um, but I, I remembered like, ah. Oh, you know, there's a lot about the Golden Trio's dynamic that is problematic, but there's a lot I like, too. And there's a lot about this world that is stupid and doesn't make any sense. But you know what? There's a lot I like, too. And so, you know, it w- I was able to do that. And I do feel like overall, the other thing that like I really got out of it was all of the things that I was angry about. It felt very cathartic to go through them step by step and be like, okay, here's the thing and here's the thing and here's the thing and like just lay it all out chronologically. Um, it helped me kind of like organize my my mind <laughs> in the way that I interacted with Harry Potter and with the Harry Potter fandom in a very like healing way. Like I feel like now I am at peace with Harry Potter. And you know what? If J.K. Rowling just stopped tweeting tomorrow, I could stay in this state and never have additional specific feelings about Harry Potter and just engage in a very like surface level and be very happy. Unfortunately, I know I will not receive that gift. Okay. J.K. Rowling does not care about making me happy for Christmas, but, um, you know, that's, it, it helped, it helped me heal that, Part of my fandom life because for better or for worse like that's a huge part of my fandom experience is the harry potter fandom no matter no matter what no matter what abhorrent thing jk rowling says that is true i can't go back and redo those years of my life they existed and they happened and they impact me so um so yeah i'm not sure i was necessarily expecting to heal from it i thought i was just gonna it was just gonna be fun getting really angry over and over. And I didn't really think about like how it would actually make me feel better, but it did. It did. And I had a similar reaction where I, I went into it obviously coming off the heels of a podcast that had been running for six months that we deep dived Harry Potter in, but felt very incomplete. And it was a lot of fun. Um, it was a lot of things that I loved to do and loved to talk about and the nuances and the media like critique that I was able to do about Harry Potter. Um, but at the time, the person that I was doing it with didn't necessarily know how to do media critique. So it was a lot of me talking at it and then having someone there either agreeing or disagreeing or me educating. I'm understanding uh, and- now why listening to the episodes <laughs> that it was how it was. I did not know that behind the scenes that 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 was happening (laughs) yes no uh and and they were obviously a big fan but it was just I mean I came from it with a uh from an English degree like and someone who had formal training on how to approach literacy and how to critique it and tear it apart and and really look at the nuance of of writing uh and they didn't and there's nothing wrong with that But obviously you have that background in it too. So it was like like being able to come and step on foot with someone who was approaching this thing that I loved on the same way from an opposite point of view was really, really like healing. 
And then also so much of my identity for so long has been wrapped up in the girl who loves Harry Potter. I have two Harry Potter tattoos. It was always like, I was the millennial that's like, I identify with Slytherin. Um, <laughs> like very much people would look at me and be like, oh, she likes Harry Potter. All of my Christmas gifts, all of my birthday gifts, parents, friends, um, family knew that if they got me something Harry Potter themed, I would probably like it. Like, that's just how it was for me. And I had, like, obviously gotten to the age where I had grown out of Harry Potter. But because so much of my identity was wrapped around Harry Potter, it was like, okay, how much of this is that I actually like it? And how much of this is that this is where the safe, comfortable part of my identity comes from? Mm. And so being able to come into it and have like the lit- like to have the literacy media critique discussions that I had been craving to have while also like learning and looking into themes in a different way really gave me the opportunity to like dissect my own feelings about my identity and how enwrapped it was with this thing from my childhood in a unique way that I hadn't been able to experience and probably wouldn't have been able to experience in any other sort of way because that's like just how enwrapped I was. Uh, Do you feel like then that you, that you now have like a a little bit of a more complicated identity because you're able to like (laughs) compartmentalize the Harry Potter part? Yeah. I think that having a, a complicated identity, but I think also like being able to sit there and be like, Oh, it's kind of like being able to put your favorite like sweater that you used to love, but that is full of holes and has stains and stuff like that in a drawer and be like, this thing was important. It was my favorite at one point in time, but now I can not let it go, but it doesn't have to be worn every day sort of thing. Mm. Uh, and that's kind of like the metaphor that this experience has kind of helped me get to with my Harry Potter fandom is that, yeah, I could easily talk about Harry Potter for 24, 24 hours. Easily. We've done it. <laughs> well, but, I'll have to go back and see how many hours we've got. Yeah, now. at this it's point probably, it's like 36. It's probably like over. Yeah, it's probably somewhere between 30 and 40 hours. <laughs> uh, but I could easily do it. And I do, and I do it again because it's interesting and fun. But it doesn't have to define me. It doesn't have to be my favorite sweater anymore. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that's like a fun, like, growing up experience that that it's just been really cool to experience through literacy and through this podcast. I I mean, I definitely feel the same way in a lot. And um, and to all of our viewers, thank you for coming along on this. I know a lot of you have had, like, some really insightful comments Yes. And um and really interesting things that that you have added to it. So I really appreciate all of you guys taking this journey with us. Um it's so so fun. yeah, I'm 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 glad I did it. I feel like I feel like now I can um I- experience Harry Potter um a lot more from like a just enjoying things uh level instead of like constantly being angry. <laughs> Um, so it's, it's, it, it's nice. It's nice, but there's a lot more to talk about with this. Like it's, it's not just yeah. about us. We also wanted to talk about the fandom overall because the Harry Potter fandom has been around, like it is a pre social media fandom and it's still a massive fandom. Um, you know, that's, that's from that time. So the Harry Potter fandom largely existed when it started on specific Harry Potter websites, like, and you can find like deep dives for this on, on YouTube if you're interested in the subject, but I'll give you kind of like a brief at the beginning of the Harry Potter fandom. There the were literally, of time. <laughs> yes, there were literally like rival websites that would have like these clicky um, turf wars over, you know, whether you shipped Ron Hermione versus Harry and Hermione, or whether, you know, um, Drumine was acceptable or not acceptable, or, you know, just like really like things like that. But because there was no social media, instead of the regular users fighting with each other, there was like drama between the admins, but you would just go to whichever sites you liked and you would post your fic on those sites, you know, like AO3 didn't exist at yeah. this time. Okay. Twitter didn't exist at this time. Like, 
a live journal was kind of the only thing that existed that was social media esque, and it was barely social media, well, not the way we and, think of it today. And even then, because of the age range that live journal really catered towards, there what Harry Potter wasn't the majority of live journal. It was a small corner of it. Um, yeah, live it, journal it, was for teens, and Harry Potter was yeah. for teens and kids. So yeah. Uh, and even in Live Journal, also, I mean, I would argue that Live Journal was for teens, but it also catered towards young adults and mm-hmm. some adult. Like I had, I had my aunt was writing on Live Journal when it was in its heyday, and she was yep. in her thirties at that point. Yep. I like, mean, Snape, it, Snape Wives, which was largely populated yeah. by thirty-something-year-old women, that was a Live Journal community. That whole drama. Again, um, there's deep dives on YouTube, but that was that was on Live Journal. Star Trek and Star Wars took up a large majority of the Live Journal like fandom corner. Mm-hmm. Um, because that that was the that was the that was like marketed towards what they assumed people who were writing fan fiction were of that age of that like because of course fan fiction has been around for longer but you went around to cons and that's how you exchanged fan fictions is that yeah, you, you literally like do a buck on swap. paper <laughs> um and so really they brought that onto the online forum onto live journal and then teens kind of teens and kids kind of infiltrated the space and Harry Potter found a little niche there. But it's important to like, to really understand that when you were in the first days of the internet in the Harry Potter fandom, you would, you would go to a website and you would exist in this bubble um, because this is where you would get your information from. This is where you would post from. This is where you would read things. And sure, you might have a couple bubbles here and there, but unless you were really close to the admin team or like really wanted to read the admin updates which i didn't i just wanted to read the harry (laughs) jitty fan fiction (laughs) nope (laughs) um you didn't care right like you didn't you didn't you didn't care Mm-hmm. Uh, like I've and talked I'm about thinking- this. I've got a good example. Sorry to interrupt. I just have a really good example because oh, go I've talked about like, oh, the Snape wives. Like I was there. Like I was there, and then like all of a sudden, I because I was there to read Snape fic. Okay, that was it. And then I realized that there was all this crazy drama, and all the admins were all these really creepy thirty-year-old women who like truly, truly believed in a lot of this stuff. You know, cult like believed in it. And and it was um it was very shocking to me because I didn't realize it until you know uh, the blowouts started happening, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but that's kind of that was the experience, right? And that was my yeah. experience too. I had no idea. <laughs> um, yeah, and it, it, it's like there was no unified Harry Potter fandom. It was pockets of fandom, and because the fandom was so young. It looked so different to how other fandoms had previously. There weren't fandom wars to the extent that there were in the Harry Potter fandoms in Star Trek and Star Wars and Lord of the Rings, right? Like a lot of those fandoms, because they were older people, were really unified. Um, There were some inner arguments, but not really. But like Harry Potter really had the like admin versus admin, full out, block out, knock out fighting. Um, Yeah that only a few people were a part of and then most people didn't even know other places existed Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so (laughs) that's how it started and then because it continued to grow and so did the internet multiple different cells became one organism yeah Um, it did feel like that yeah, because like there was all these disparate websites of fanfic and I don't know if other parts of the Harry Potter fandom existed at this time, but for me they didn't. Like I really just engaged with certain fanfic websites and live journal communities, right? And that was my engagement with Harry Potter. So if there was such a thing as like people making knockoff Harry Potter merch or whatever, like I didn't know about it. I barely even knew much about what was going on in like the Harry Potter fan art community. You know, mm-hmm. I really didn't. Um and uh and, until until like social media really came into play and things like Twitter came about. Right. And then it kind of grew from there into Tumblr. Yeah. And I'm like, and the the biggest one. Yeah. Harry Potter's uh, fandom community really jumped on Tumblr quick. Like when I joined Tumblr, it was one of the very first fandoms I was able to find a lot of good content on and find a lot of good blogs on to kind of like fill out my dash, you know, and have some stuff to look at. Um, there was a lot of Harry Potter content on Tumblr 
And, uh, and I mean, I joined Tumblr a little bit late, but not like that late. And, uh, and there was like, and there was already a ton on there. Yeah. And, and obviously like fanfiction.net and then AO3 and then Tumblr, it all sort of just like existed in one space. And because algorithms weren't perfected and Tumblr's purpose was for you to continue to grow and see more tum and see more tumblr blogs all of a sudden fandom or fans that were like so used to one niche area of the harry potter fandom were being exposed to other areas and advertised on their like it's not even a for you page it's their home their home page i don't even remember what it's called it's the um, dashboard it's just the, the dashboard, dashboard. There we don't you even go. really have a name for it we just call it the dash but that wasn't official yeah that you suddenly started seeing other things on your dash. And there wasn't a, especially in those early days of Tumblr, there wasn't a good way to filter it. So you either just kind of fell into it and accepted it, got really into it and like started following blogs, or you were filled with hate and started spewing that hate into your dash and into your posts, which then fueled more and more ire and hate within the fandom yep like i didn't even know until i was part of the harry potter like tumblr stuff that people were like so vehement about various remus lupin ships you know what i mean what yeah. what i want more viewers um uh, trying to figure out how to person I, I can always have to refigure it out too I reported them. I can't find the block button. Whatever. Um. Oh, thank you, there thank you, Lunar. Thank you, Lunar. Thank you, Lunar. All right. So, um. So yeah. So it was. It was very interesting in regards to the Harry Potter fandom. And now there isn't really. Um. There isn't really a certain like. There isn't really a certain like a uh, um. Specific forums for mm -hmm. harry potter you know like it doesn't really like exist like you just go on social media and you find the harry potter tag of whatever website <laughs> you're on and i almost feel like that i feel like we're going to enter this new era in fandom because of um ermine muskrat killing twitter which has been just amazing um to watch uh i am thoroughly entertained by this train wreck <laughs> but like if Twitter goes, then and and Tumblr's Tumblr is like gaining traction again. But I mean, since they had the porn ban, like I don't think they're ever really gonna fully come back. Instagram, I feel like, is on its way out. Um, because they keep making mm -hmm. these algorithmic changes like Facebook did, which basically made everybody leave Facebook. Like, what are we left with? We're left with TikTok. Like, well, I think that what else is there? I think the other like sort of thing to bring up to that is that also when tumblr had its downfall the harry potter fandom went to these other sites but they diversified content so all of a sudden people went to youtube and started making long form fa fan videos yeah people went to twitter and started doing the memes and reblogging memes that way people went to instagram and did more um aesthetically involved either character rp or other forms of like character aesthetics and yeah. photo hyper things and then tiktok at, as the rise of tiktok has come we've seen more short form videos we've seen a little bit of combination with all those things but it's really important to like recognize that like this diversification was also a separation of some sorts um now that the fandom like and now we're all in bubbles again because very rarely do you follow Harry Potter Twitter and Harry Potter Instagram and Harry Potter TikTok and Harry Potter Tumblr and mm -hmm. Harry Potter this and oh Harry God, Potter that, much. right? You usually stick to your social media that you use most often and really gain the, and, and really interact with the, with the fandom that exists there. So we had this like coming together of fandom, this uni like uni unified toxic mess of a fandom on tumblr and then a diversification of it yeah uh yeah. and and even though like obviously ao3 is still around and stuff like that fan fiction is still pretty centralized but fan art videos all of that is 
is now diversified. Mm-hmm. And um, it's it's interesting what the next steps look like, because I agree with you that a lot of these social medias are dying and there isn't really a place for these fandoms that now have defined their own terms and their own expectations of their fandom to go to one central hub. Yep. Like, I'll give an example. Like, on Twitter, you see a lot because J.K. Rowling's primary, you know, uh, her primary space is Twitter. So you see a lot of, like, the angry ex-Harry Potter fans. Like, that is a Mm -hmm. lot of the fandom on Twitter. But then you go over to TikTok and you see these, like, like people my age, cosplayers that really don't want to, they just don't engage, period, with J.K. Rowling at all. It feels like a very different fandom when you look at Harry Potter content on TikTok. It feels like people that are just like pretending J.K. Rowling doesn't exist, um, you know, and kind of like that other side of it. And then you go over to Tumblr and you see this kind of like these long form massive essays on Harry Potter mixed in with like ship uh, art, you know? Yeah. Um, I don't know what goes on on Instagram because I, I haven't, I don't touch Instagram. I think, it's a lot of, I-, I think it's a lot of posting art. Like I think art yeah, is it must be pretty- fan art. Yeah, fan yeah. art is posted on Twitter as well as I think on Instagram. Yeah, I find most um, fan art that I look at is is on Twitter and Tumblr. Yeah, but I, I think that it's just like this interesting position that we put ourselves in because there isn't a clear path forward of where it's going to go and what it's going to look like. Yeah. Um, And then also, I think that that's something that's incredibly important here to talk about um, is as like an newer generation comes to the rise that didn't necessarily live through the complex of like Anne Rice and her anti-fan fiction sort of uh, tirade and the relationships that authors used to have with fan fiction writers and the copyright right laws that were really like brought down hard. Mm. Um, they have no awareness of it. So we see a lot more um, either fan fictions being independently published skinning around like copyright laws by like not selling the fan fiction but instead selling like the binding of the fan fiction yeah or selling yeah, like they, the they file off the art. serial numbers <laughs> <laughs> um yeah or or in general reskinning fan fiction into completely new works uh thinking this isn't a harry potter example but thinking like the Fifty Shades of Grey relationship to Twilight. Yep. That's something used to be a fan fiction uh, and is now gone through, changed all the names and is published with new names very clearly taking up after these Harry Potter characters. Yep, yep. And um, I think 50, 50 Shades is the quintessential example that everybody knows where like if you if you know it's Twilight fanfic going in, it is very obvious and you can see it, but it's not obvious that enough that if you have no idea that you would necessarily know. Yeah, exactly. So, um, and a lot of these on, Harry Potter fanfics are like that too. Carry on Simon Snow, um, yep. any of the, uh, any of the, what's going to call it? Um, There's one like um, uh, City of Bones. City of Bones, uh, Leo, yeah, that's what yeah. I'm thinking of. Um, any of those kinds of of things, you'll see so many more as well that exist. Um, th- that you, if you don't know, then you don't know. But if you do know, then it's very obvious. And I get it as a writer. If you're going to write a hundred and fifty thousand words of a fan fiction, and it's going to go through an editing process, and it's going to like have thousands of hits. Of course, you're going to want to sit there and be like, I dedicated hours and hours and hours to this. How can I monopolize that and make money off of it? Um, and I think that that's highly important, but it is an interesting direction that the fan that the fandom is going. Um, and it is something that we're seeing. And I don't know how, because the backlash of the relationship with everything with you know, writers hating fan fiction was taken so negatively and had such a negative impact, but also intellectual property laws are so important, especially with the monopolization of the publishing companies existing right now. If you don't know what I'm talking about, there's only about five major publishing companies in the world at the moment um, that publish most books because Penguin Random House is, is owning all of them. Um, it's a really sad state. It's a really sad state. I'm very scared for my future. Um, your 
it, it's just an interesting like being like okay when is this dam gonna break because it's going to break and it's going to break hard i just feel like it, it's it's going to be very indicative of what we have going on in this country where we need to redo our copyright laws they are not sustainable like oh. we can't just let when when the copyright holder passes away <laughs> that their family and their estate or their company they left behind gets to just own the ip for forever and ever amen like that is not sustainable but that is the current paradigm that we have and i almost feel like a lot of this redoing fan fiction as original content and uh, filing off the serial numbers is kind of, it's almost like a return to form for humanity. Cause if you think about a lot of classic literature, it really is just fanfic, you know, Dante's Inferno is Bible fanfic. Almost everything like we talked Shakespeare, we learned Shakespeare, almost everything Shakespeare wrote is a copy of a copy of a copy, you know, Romeo and Juliet is Tristan and he sold and like, mm-hmm. it just goes on and on and on. Um, and I'm, I'm pulling like very old examples, but it's not just those. Those are just the ones that I know everybody will know what I'm talking about if I say And them. Harry Potter, I mean, Harry Potter is also made up of uh, ideas yeah. and storylines that existed yeah, beyond it. it. J.K. Rowling didn't journey. come up with that shit by herself. She did no. not come up with that shit by herself. You the know? hero's <laughs> journey is also, a, is also a phenomenon in fiction that we study. Like, if you mm-hmm. really break things down, there are about four plots in the entire world. That's like, at the end of the day, like, I had a literacy professor at one point in time sit there and be like, uh, stories are either broken into two things. It's either a stranger comes to town or someone leaves town. Uh, and it's like, yeah, that's true. That is well, that is every base of almost every story. And just to be clear, what we're talking about when we say that really is kind of like the Western English literature. Obviously, yes. if you study literature that has different roots than um, Anglo, you know, based or, or very Western European based, you're going to find other things. But we're going to assume, based on the Twitch analytics, that most of you guys are in the Anglosphere. So, you know, for the experiences that we have with literature and media, that's largely going to be what we experience. Yes. Um, So, yeah, I think that that's a really, like, interesting concept to talk about and to think about as far as what the future of fandom holds um, and what it looks like. And And I don't even think that that's the only thing that, like, plays a part especially in the harry potter fandom um i think that there's this also like this huge question of like what are we going to do with the elephant in the room or better stately put what are we going to do with the turf in the room like are we going to continue to accept and listen to what the owner of this work and the creator of this work is saying continue to give her a platform are we going to deny the whole oh jkr didn't write these Harry Potter books. I'm just going to scratch her name or white out her name in all the books. Um, Or are we going to find a happy medium between the two of those? Because I think that also plays an incredibly important part in modern day fandom and the future of this fandom. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yep. But um, kind of before we get to that whole continuum, because I think there's a lot of meat there, I would like to pause really quick and uh, and take a word from our sponsors. So um, as you guys know, Interstage Window is sponsored by Audible. You can get your Audible free trial at um, audibletrial.com slash interstage window. I'm putting a link in the chat right now. If I can spell, can I spell while I talk? I can spell while I talk. Um, and the reason why this is um, for important for us to bring up today is we would like to give you a little bit of information about our plans for uh, 2023. Okay, we have picked out our book series for 2023 that we're going to go through. What is it? <gasps> we're going to do the Hunger Games. Yes. Uh- oh, my God. I am so excited to talk about a book series where I don't have... Um, a ridiculous complex relationship with the author. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, I'll get to like go in with talking about her, Suzanne Collins in a much more nuanced way than I can talk about JK Rowling. It's just, oh, I am refreshed. I am renewed. We are so (laughs) excited to talk about Hunger Games. So in 2023, the book series that we are going to cover is the Hunger Games. That includes the three books, okay, the four movies and the newest book, the Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes. Is that right, Landon? Yes. Yes. Okay. So I am going to tell you guys, if you do not have Audible and you would like to talk about the Hunger Games with us, a really easy way would be to go to audibletrial.com slash interstage window 
and sign up for your free trial. Download the first Hunger Games book with the credit that you get with that free trial so that you can get started with us in 2023. I think there is four movies because I'm pretty sure the last book they split into two. They did one of those. Yes. They one of those like book one, book two, and then and book actually, three was like four, right? And, and we'll talk about it, but actually I think one of the better ones to have done that. Like truly, Ooh. truly one of the... A smart move on their part. Oh, spoilers. Uh, but, spoilers but we'll talk about that. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, yes. we'll get into so, all that. There's also a movie coming, I think, in 2003. I think for this the... time next year for the new book that was mm-hmm. published last year. So if everything so, goes to plan, we will end that with doing an episode on the movie adaptation of the uh, Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes. Yes. So very um, exciting. So very exciting. I'm also really excited to talk about the fandom that exists in this series. Yeah. Um, because it's not so much about the fandom that revolved around it, but more of the media attention uh that this fandom got and how media ran away with something that had nothing to do with the originality of what the books are about anyway. Um so I would like to remind everyone as they're reading this book that the protagonist is not supposed to be likable um, and that this is truly YA. There is no, we are going into a YA sort of state of mind. Um, And so you're going to see familiar tropes. You're going to see questioning decisions, but you're also going to see an unlikable protagonist being forced in a world uh, that seems unrealistic. And that is the true trope of YA that we love. So follow along. It'll be a lot of fun. Yes. If any of that intrigues you, go download the first one today so that you can hang out with us and talk about uh, Hunger Games. The good news is is that they are at, I think that all of the books are shorter than what the average Harry Potter book is. Mm So uh, we will consistently, I think we have the plan to get them out on an every other month schedule and uh, they'll, it'll be a lot of fun. Yes. I'm very, very excited. I'm so excited to talk about it. So yes, Hunger Games next year. That's our book series. Um, also, since we're talking about it, I will let you guys know that in January, we're going to we're gonna start, we're going to kick off the year. We're going to do that Fantastic Beasts episode, but also in January, we're going to do our musical episode because we like to have an episode on a musical every year. And um, this is one that Landon really enjoys. I have never seen it, so I'll be going in with fresh eyes. So it's going to be, uh, it's called Last Five Years, right? Yes. So there isn't a huge fandom around this, but I think that it's an interesting form of storytelling. And I think it'll be a really interesting uh, depth of character that I, I, I'm i excited to hear your perspective on this form of storytelling, as well as uh, what the story is about. Well, it has. It's my very favorite. different from what we've talked about so far. Yeah. So it has it has my favorite Pitch Perfect lady, um, Anna Kendrick. So I have a feeling I will enjoy it. But if you're interested in any of that, come back in January. We'll be doing all that. We will. All right. So let's get let's get into this. Like we have got in the Harry Potter fandom now, this kind of continuum of a fan, right? We've got Mm -hmm. on one hand these like ex fans that are like, you know, I hate JK Rowling now, you know, she's terrible. And I'm going to, you know, say that I am going to pretend I never liked Harry Potter. And I don't know why people like Harry Potter and da, 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 da. And like, like, in some, there's some kernels of truth to that. But I think there's a lot of anger in that, too. I've definitely seen people say, like, I never liked Harry Potter that are like, I'm like, you are such a little lying liar, man. And I know you're a liar. (laughs) And then we've got all the way on the, the other side of the spectrum. We've got these people that like, they still love Harry Potter and Harry Potter is still a major part of their identity. And the way that they deal with it is they just don't talk about JK Rowling. Okay. They just don't talk. And then you've got like everything in between, right? Like you've got the people that are just like Hatsune Miku wrote Harry Potter. Um, and they like to engage with Harry Potter and, pre- and pretend like they can do that without acknowledging JK Rowling. And then you've got the like, what I call the new Harry Potter fans, people that really truly never were into Harry Potter and are literally just there because they're TERFs or they love TERFs or whatever. Um, and they pretend that they are these Harry Potter fans and they are not. Okay, they are not. They don't. They they never really engaged with Harry Potter. They they engage. They're engaging with J.K. Rowling's current political positions on Twitter. They're fans of mm-hmm. that, um, not of Harry Potter exactly, right? So we've got this like whole continuum, this whole continuum of different fans 
um, I think, right now. And it's hard to tell sometimes when you step into a Harry Potter space what you're stepping into. Yeah. And I don't want to dive into it yet because we're going to talk about this, but I also think it's important to mention the uh, fans that are also being raised with Harry Potter in a very different yes. way than we were raised with Harry Potter, as in like their parents were Harry Potter fans. And so they have been reading Harry Potter since they were a young child. Yeah. So we're going to put uh, a pin in that one. The the, yes. the millennials, the but, millennials kids, right? The millennials then, kids. Yes, but an important an important realization that 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 those spaces that we're going to be talking about also exist for those kids. Yes. Um. So, yeah, I think that the best way to start is to talk about like all of the different reactions to JKR's statements. Yeah. Oh of like gosh. that she comes out and she goes on a turf rampage of being trans is unnatural. Um. And trying to be very pro-woman while being extremely Mm -hmm. anti-trans. And there are really only three reactions that happen. And that is anger that people engage in Twitter, engage and talk about it on their online forums. um, That shout kind of into the void and get their pitchforks and, and torches and start trying to run amok. Uh, full of their anger which is valid there is ignore ignoring or ignorance of like didn't even know that it happened don't want to talk about it don't want to think about it and then there's vermint agreement uh which is a much smaller portion of that yeah but they're the loudest and most annoying <laughs> They're, <sighs> I think, I don't even think they're the loudest and most, they are certainly the most annoying, but I don't think they're the loudest. I think that they're the ones that are then uh, given the platform to speak because the person who's on who, the JKR is going to only listen to those people. So we have um, got like this very recent situation where JK Rowling says that she's going to financially back this new like women's shelter. And in this women's shelter, it's going to employ and serve cisgender women only. So somehow she's, she's gonna, I mean, I guess I can see how you can make sure all of your employees are, are cis to a degree. I think you can, you can, in your interview process, probably, you know, do something to kind of like invasively figure that out. But I don't know, like how the heck when like a, a someone in need comes in, are you going to make a determine on determination on their gender identity from like the quick little introduction that you have before you provide them services? It doesn't make any fucking sense to me. But this is her newest thing that she's going to do. She's going to financially back this organization. How it's probably going to happen is that if they won't be able to make a determination based on discrimination up front, um, but if they will find out that a person within their shelter, a woman within their shelter is biologically Hi, I hear you. Thank you. Ah. Sorry, my cat is <laughs> angry that we're talking about this because he is anti-turf as much as everybody else. I mean, I'm pretty um, angry too. So yes, this no, is direct um, harm. By the way, this is not just tweets. This is this organization. No, 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 if, this it, is if it launches, harm. will be direct harm. Uh, what they will find out is that they will, uh, they will probably most likely uh, press charges and or kick out that person, and then might financially receive like uh, seek compensation from that person uh for damages done so really like harming causing more harm active harm to people that they are supposed to be supporting so they can't Disgusting. upright like sit there and be like drop your trousers we need to make sure that you are a what we define as a woman biologically um which is disgusting they won't be able to do that but they will be able to if anybody like was found out uh, they would be able to do that uh, retroactively, which also is like not only terrible against trans people, but sets up an unsafe shelter towards everybody because mm-hmm. all of a sudden there's this state of fear of it takes one accusation from um from a employee or another member of the uh, that's receiving services to be to be put back in an unsafe situation. Yep. Um because technically like once once someone complains about oh I think that this person is trans and they're secretly a man, uh there's no way to defend that mm-hmm. from then on out. So the, all of a sudden the shelter will then 
then put you back on the streets or will no longer help you or any of these terrible, terrible options. Uh, and you might be banned from a resource that exists to help you on the word of one other person. Yep. Yeah. Rar, I, we're getting to that. We're getting to that. So I want to build up to kind of the next layer of this because this makes mm-hmm. me think of two things. One, Lady Gaga to the things that are happening in in the sports where they're having similar like issues with trying to keep the transes out. Right. Okay. So let's all remember uh, Lady Gaga is a recording artist, of course, pop star who uh, when she she can be beautiful and be sexy if she wants to. But often she chooses to present herself as simply strange. Like so Lady Gaga's version of an alien doesn't look like a sexy alien. It looks like an alien. Right. And because of these artistic choices that she may, has made in many of her music videos and many of her red carpet appearances and things of that nature, she is one of the very, very popular um, people for these transphobes to go after and claim that this person is trans, this person is was not born a woman, whatever, whatever, right? right. And Lady Gaga's response to this was to go on one of her tours with some... Um, P word floss. That's what she was wearing. Do y'all remember that outfit? I remember that outfit. She's like, you think I'm a man? Let me let me like show you my whole junk. And um, it was hilarious. Uh, (laughs) People still say it. Okay, it didn't do anything, which is the whole point of me bringing it up. She is still one of the most popular uh, people for these people to go after and say you are secretly trans. Yeah. Look it up. Look up Lady Gaga P word that I'm not going to say on the YouTube or the Twitch. Uh, when when we're talking about, it, I don't mind saying the word. I mind saying it around this topic because I think it's just too much stuff together. YouTube will have an issue with me anyway. Yes, no, P word floss. Um, look it up. It's a fantastic outfit. Um, she looks great. <laughs> she looks insane. Um, which I love. Right. So so it makes me think of that and and how she went to such lengths to show her genitals and yet (laughs) it didn't stop it didn't stop and the other thing this makes me think of is what's going on in sports right now right if you look at any reputable news source talking about these trans sports issues like you know what i'm saying is like not fox news you're good i mean we know you're sick poor landon and you're (laughs) sick of talking about this stuff i'm sick of talking about this stuff too life is so dangerous for trans people right now yes um anyways this this sports thing if you go look at any reputable news source in regards to what's going on with these uh these people trying to prevent trans people being in sports right um so i'm saying like not fox news not you know joke websites etc like you get the idea Um, What you will find is a lot of stories about how black women are excluded from sports like there's there's multiple instances where they do things like testosterone level testing or bone density testing or whatever they're like, you know, skull shape adjacent bullshit to figure out what your biological gender is that they're doing. And somehow it's like. The black women that are not biological woman enough. How funny is that? Wow. (laughs) Where have we heard that before? This cannot be a coincidence. It can't. I mean, it's literally measuring the shape of your skull to determine your personality. Bullshit all over again. You cannot look at the level of hormones in someone's body to determine their assigned gender at birth. You can barely look at their genitals like it doesn't okay because for i'll just we've talked about this before but for anybody that doesn't know i'm just quick explanation of how uh sex actually works in biology sex is a binomial distribution so what that means is that you've got you've got like a distribution where you're all where you're all over the this whole spectrum right so if we go to this from here to here this is it right and the way that the binomial distribution works is you've got a lot of people on either end. So if we if this if this wrist is men and this wrist is women, right? Most people fall into these camps. But you can fall anywhere in between. So you kind of end up with this graph when you when you graph the biological gender that's like if this is your line then it kind of goes like this, right? Most people fall on the ends, but there's all these people in between, right? And 
The truth is, is it is not standard practice because there's no medical reason to do so to chromosomally test people. And so you might believe you're all the way on one end or at the other, but the truth is, is you don't know. You mm-hmm. don't know. You could have differences in your XY chromosomes that do not make you part of either end, right? And if you don't have any of the medical problems or medical concerns that can result from that, you would never know. For example, if you are a woman, right, and you never try to get pregnant, then there's a chance that you have some kind of hormonal or chromosomal issue that you might never know about. But then, because there's a lot of people that discover these things when they go to fertility specialists, like, yeah. oh, you're having trouble because you have this condition or that condition that affects your chromosomes or your hormones or whatever. And it's totally possible to have these with a very low amount of symptoms to where you just, you just never know. Yeah. And so I mean, I, testing is crazy. Without crazy. trying to center myself in this conversation, I'll talk about my stuff as I, yeah. I have PCOS, polycystic ovary syndrome, which means that I have a high level of testosterone, um, very much higher than average level of dis- testosterone, which means that if someone was just basing off of blood work as a cis woman, I would not be welcome in shelters like this because I do not align with what the average white woman level of testosterone is, which is what they would make the norm. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and apparently, then, Lunar, Lunar has PCOS too. I think that's what yeah, she's saying. Yeah, it, it is an incredibly common. Uh, <laughs> it's an incredibly common thing among among women, mm-hmm. um, more predominantly, unfortunately, in, in women of color, but white women obviously get it too. Um, and it's, it is incredibly common, but it has a higher level of testosterone, a lower level of, of estrogen. And because of that, we wouldn't fit what a white deciding company would determine as a rate of normal. Um, and it's ter- it like so that all of a sudden it rules out a whole level of group of class of women that aren't trans like that exist within the cis circles so they would rule that out like because that's unethical yeah. it, it, the the reality is is that with this thing that JKR is trying to back there is no way to test other than to say pull your pants down. I want to see. And even then with Mm -hmm. reconstructive surgery and any sort of surgery that also doesn't, isn't a hundred percent accurate, but it's also sexual assault on women (laughs) who have poverty, (laughs) trans women of poverty. (laughs) So what, but, and what if a trans woman has been on hormones for many, many years and has also had bottom surgery? There is a high likelihood that if they're in that situation, you would look and never fucking no have no idea no have idea. no idea uh and and it just there like the science behind the arguments that 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 jkr is supporting doesn't make any fucking sense nope um and that's what a lot of the fandom is sitting there and shouting and saying but because she's a turf and because she has her views and because she's fucking terrible, she's not going to listen to that. She's going to listen to the small percentage of people who agree with her. And those people uh, are telling her that they are Harry Potter fans. And yeah. I'm sure some of them were Harry Potter fans when it was coming out. But like I see what's going on on Twitter and I watch these accounts and most of them, they really aren't. They aren't fandom accounts at all. You know, they're just random people <laughs> they're just random people that are interested in her political ideas and those political ideas are trash <laughs> uh, and actively and actively harm women which is her whole platform to sit there and say i do not want to harm women but the reality is that she has a specific idea of what women are and what women are to jk are is white cis and heterosexual whether she's willing to admit that publicly or not at this point that is what she believes that is what the science she is trying to say is accurate supports and that is wrong on so many levels uh 
And it's hard in the fandom to sit there and say that this thing that is beloved and this thing that has been created is created by someone who is causing not only emotional harm, but active harm by throwing where their the money where their mouth is, by willing to support people in government with the same ideas as she does, um, and is willing to spread misinformation that actively helps queer children kill themselves. Oh, I mean, at the end of the day, that's what it is, right? That's what it is. And so her primary flat platform is on Twitter. So I think that when you go on Twitter, you get a lot more of these people that are having these reactions of like either, oh, I never liked Harry Potter or things that are like, um, I'm going to pretend that Hatsune Miku wrote Harry Potter or whatever. Like there's a lot of these mm-hmm. type of reactions. And then you go over to something like Harry Potter TikTok Which- and no one ever talks about her- JK Rowling. They're just like cosplaying and having fun, you know, and it's like she doesn't even exist um, because she's and- not there. She's not on TikTok in your face all the time. And, and some of it, some of it is like, I do want to argue that because there are certainly parts of Harry Potter TikTok that do do that. And it's usually, but unfortunately it's usually activism and how the, how the uh, app works is that if you don't engage in that content, the less likely it is to show you. So if you're already willing to engage in the activist point of content where you are talking about and seeing videos of this subject, and you also happen to enjoy some Harry Potter videos, the app is going to streamline these Mm -hmm. two niches together to you. Um, But if you're not willing to engage in one, then you're not going to see the other. You're not even going to know it exists. Yep. Like if you're just looking at regular fandom TikTok, you're never going to see it. You could, and you could probably even search it. And unless your algorithm matches that, it won't show you that. Like you could even, unless you have like a specific person, yeah. you could probably Google JKR turf or you can search that up on um, on TikTok and it will show you something that has more in line to do with your algorithm than it necessarily has to do with that. Mm-hmm. Because the app is trying to not get you emotional so that you'll click off. It's trying to yeah. keep you there. It's trying to get you the the right emotions to keep you on TikTok. <laughs> not the emotions that make you close TikTok. <laughs> I also I also want to talk about like that absolute denial being a level of like coping and that yeah. being being something that like I understand of uh, to sit there and be like it, it's just easier to pretend that JKR doesn't exist. I agree. Because you are one person. You are one small person with very very limited and li- and limited power. Um most likely limited money. Um, you don't have a lot of capital to change either socially as far as the people around you and influence the people around you. Um, so what are you going to do? Yeah. Right. It's like that hopeless feeling of being like, I see this tweet, whether it affects me or not, is actively hurting against my belief or my existence. What can I do about it? Mm -hmm. And it, flight and freeze is a reactive of like a reaction of our neurosystem neuro neuro system that makes sense. Mm-hmm. And I think like you can see this pretty commonly. This like uh, these reactions whenever you go to any streamer who has tweeted something like, "Are you planning on playing or streaming Hogwarts Legacies?" Okay, mm-hmm. so when you see tweets like that that blow up and you click on the comments you see several different things you see one a lot of people saying absolutely not because i'm not going to add to the harm that jk rowling is doing to trans people you also see people that are saying things like well yeah it's just a game and she's a billionaire already i I can't can't do anything about that Um, You see arguments and there's some arguments that you'll see in these tweet threads that make kind of sense to me. It's things like, well, you know, Elon Musk owns Twitter and you're using Twitter. (laughs) And it's like, well, I kind of understand that. But then if you keep scrolling, you keep scrolling, you will see the sad things where the turfs find the tweet. Mm. And you will just see the straight up transphobia, especially if the original tweet came from a trans person. Um, Just saying just god awful mean things, slurs, you know, insulting the person that asked the question, 
uh, things of this nature. And it is very, very sad. But if you find those tweets, you will find like all all the whole continuum of opinions um, in in this question of the the game that's coming out. And I wanted to address this game specifically uh, as somebody who streams games and I'm always looking for games with good stories. And it looks like Hogwarts Legacy will have a very interestingly problematic story, which might be might be uh, something to talk about. You know what I'm saying? So I wanted to try to answer the question of will I play Hogwarts Legacy as well? I'm not going to deny. The game looks really fucking good. OK, looks, looks like it has an amazing character creation system. I cannot see myself streaming this game because I just don't know how I'm going to react to it if the world and the story is going to be an- enough um, to kind of pull me out of just thinking about JK Rowling constantly as I'm playing it. So it's still a big question mark for me. I'm not going to lie. The only thing I'm sure of is that if I get it, I'm not streaming it. I'll play it on my own and let you guys know what I think of it. But I do believe that like, if you get this game and you want to play it, that doesn't make you a bad person who hates trans people. Because the truth is, we in our world have a supply-driven economy, and a boycott of this game is not going to do anything. This is one tiny part of the Harry Potter franchise. And there's a lot of Harry Potter content that's straight up good. Like, yeah, the Fantastic Beast movies flopped. Probably aren't going to get more movies. But them theme parks, they're good. And they're probably going to mm-hmm. continue to expand those. You know, um, I don't doubt that another adaptation of the books will eventually happen. Um, you know, Cursed Child was pretty successful, even though reading the play, people tear it apart and it's apparently awful. But apparently seeing it, it's it's pretty good, you know. So it's just, it's very up in the air. I I don't think... I don't think that there's much value in saying that you're a bad person if you continue to engage with new Harry Potter content. I think that is missing the forest for the trees and life is short. And I think there are better ways to advocate for our trans friends and allies than condemning people that are continuing to engage you know i think you 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 do more with helping the people that want to continue to engage understand that uh what jk rowling is doing is truly harmful and and educating them about trans issues than um just saying you're evil for playing the game Mm -hmm. and then one other additional thought i had on that and a big reason why even if even if the game comes out and it's fantastic and it fits my stream or whatever i still won't be streaming it because when I look in the comments of those games on Twitter, I see the turfs, and I cannot possibly imagine risking attracting that type of person to my stream. Can't do it. Can't do it. I also think there's probably enough people who are completely oblivious to the online fervor and avoid the news who will continue to feed the HP money machine for a long time anyway. I totally agree. I totally agree. Mo- like and Most I- people don't know. Most people are very casual in their fandom, and they have no fucking clue. And I think that like the reality is is that that's okay. Like, I I think that the way that Karen said it uh, was perfect. That there are there are better things that you can do with your time and energy than being anti Harry Potter. Um, that this denial of the fact that JKR wrote the Harry Potter books does just as much damage to the trans community than like someone who's actively not willing to engage with anything Harry Potter. Mm-hmm. If you're if you go both extremes, you're denying the existence of what is happening. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think that that's really important to remember when this continues to be such a hot button topic. Yep. That our duty as people of either, uh, and I, again, can only talk for myself, but as a privileged person who is cis-ish, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Close enough, you know, right? um, who, who, who isn't affected actively by JKR's abhorrent statements, 
what I can do is continue to where I ra- continue to raise awareness and educate the people in my life about this. Educate the people who are oblivious. Um, that is going to do so much more work and positivity and actually engaging in the issue than me sitting there and denying Harry Potter for the rest of my life. Um, originally when this started, I made the, I made like the, the thing of being like, oh, I'll never buy anything official Harry Potter merch again. The, the, for me, that's not necessarily realistic. I like some of the official Harry Potter merch. I went to go see Fantastic Beasts. But what I did do is I said for every dollar I spend to Harry Potter, I spend a dollar to the Trevor Project or I spend a dollar to another another activist so that more of my money is going into the pockets of the people who need it and the harm to the community that I'm doing than the 10 cents to the dollar that is going to JKR because that my 10 cents isn't going to change Joanne's views it's our 20 cents combined our five dollars combined on the stream isn't going to change views or what she's making or her perspective yep so we can can focus on changing the views of those that that are around us right so think about your family your coworkers, your friends i think that our job as allies right as people that believe that the struggle of trans people is the struggle of all of us and that the way to have a better world is to help with all of those struggles is that when your friends or coworkers or family say weird, suspicious, kind of transphobic shit, say something, be like, oh, I'm not, that wasn't cool. Or like ask them questions so that they get to think about it. Or inject your perspective, like, I'm not sure about that. I kind of think this. Or, you know, conversations like that with people that you're close with that might actually listen to you. Mm -hmm. I think that we have a lot more impact in that way. And I think a huge part of it, too, is not engaging online. Um, well, strangers that aren't going to listen to you well, anyways. Who are not gonna listen to. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. I am the number one angry Facebook poster. When someone post something on Facebook dear god it takes everything in my energy to not like to just like want to be like let me write or, something scathing in return <laughs> um, some of the Facebook comment fights from a couple, several well it's like several years ago now <laughs> poor land are fantastic. my god <laughs> I love it it brings me a certain level of joy they weren't helpful sometimes what is more successful is dropping a link So that you just respond with a link and that link can be to the Trevor Project. That link can be to an article about how much harm it costs. You are not trying to change the mind of the person tweeting. You are trying to change the mind of the person who was reading that tweet eventually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You are never going to change a stranger's mind on the internet. You won't ever do it. There's psychology wise could tell you all the reasons you, there, there is a, there's a sunk cost effect. There's the fact that you're a stranger, there's identity to wrapped up in it. There's like the getting off on like the anonymous of it all. You're never going to change a stranger's minds. You might influence somebody who doesn't have a dog in the fight. And the best way you can do that is not getting emotional and just providing information. Mm-hmm. And I know that that's, easy for somebody that looks like me that no one's going to ever look at me and not think that I'm a cis woman. I mean, like, come on, like, I mean, Mm -hmm. (laughs) no one's ever. So it's very, it's easy to have those conversations. And I think that's where, you know, we can come in as allies is to ask those questions when people say those things, to make those comments when people say those things, not to strangers, but like to, to the people, you know, around, like if you're sitting with a bunch of coworkers and they start, um, and they start, you know, getting transphobic, you know, maybe be, maybe be like, Hey, you know, you don't necessarily know someone that's at this table right now in this conversation could be trans and they just haven't told us yet. And you're saying these things, Mm -hmm. would you say that to somebody that was sitting here with us and, you know, and, and kind of like try to see if you can guide that conversation into a better way, because most people I don't believe have these bigoted views because they are super entrenched in them. It's just that they're, they're all around us in the zeitgeist and we just absorb them. And most people ain't got time to give them critical thought. And so, you know, if they're not super entrenched, 
I and most people really aren't. Most people don't have strong political convictions, let's be honest. Most mm-hmm. of them have the political convictions they have been told by those around them. I think just asking a few questions. Uh, you have so much more impact in changing that person's mind than Twitter arguments that you're never mm-hmm. going to win anyways, you know? And yeah, so I think that like, and also like, I think a huge part about this too is accepting how people want to engage in fandom is valid. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that shooting down anyone's level of engagement, whether it be entrenchment, whether that be casual, whether that be even denial, I think is harmful. Uh, it's taking away from the real fight. Being angry at someone for buying something that J.K. Rowling profits on is is a tran- transference of anger. Mm-hmm. You're angry and hurt at the turf. Yes. Don't be angry and hurt at the person who decided to go to Harry Potter world. Don't be angry and hurt at the person who decided to buy a Harry Potter book for their kid. Be angry and hurt at the person who is responsible for doing it and educate the people around you. Be a good ally and offer a safety place for those who are in danger, whether that be your time, your resources, or your money. Yeah, Yeah, because your consumption is not activism. I think that's like the whole point of this, that like all of these different ways of engaging are very personal and attacking each other over them isn't doing anything anyway, because at the end of the day, consumption is not activism. And I it's think not. it took, no, and I think it took me this journey to recognize that. Yeah. Because there, like, when I started this, there was a lot of guilt of like, okay, we have a platform, we are expressing Harry Potter, we're bringing, like, obviously, it's not far reaching, and we're not influenced whether Harry Potter is famous or not, right? But, like, where is the morality of talking about this? Yeah, uh, we're still leaders in our the... friend group, I feel like, you yeah. know, so oh, there's yeah, something absolutely. there. But where is the morality of, like, letting my entire life and image be tied to Harry Potter, knowing yeah. where Harry Potter is going? Like, again, because I was talking about, like, my identity being wrapped in Harry Potter. As Harry Potter continues to go and be tainted by turfism, what the fuck does that mean for me, right? <laughs> like, how how can I still relate to something that is so hurt, that is being used as a vehicle of hurt, mm-hmm. right? And then recognizing that it doesn't have to be, mm-hmm. that I make it my own, that you can make it your own. Uh, and that that's part of this work that we've done and will continue to do in my relationship with Harry Potter is to sit there and be like, yeah, there are some pretty terrible things that are wrong and hilarious and silly and stupid. And we can still enjoy it. Yeah. Yeah. It makes it easier for me to uh, choose my engagement with the Harry Potter fandom because it is happening more and more when you walk into a space and you don't know if it's actually been infiltrated by turfs or not. Uh, mm-hmm. Because my relationship with Harry Potter has become much more loose, it is very easy for me now to block that account or exit that <laughs> space when I realize that I have stumbled upon uh, that what I call the faux part of the Harry Potter fandom. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so, what, so yeah. Um, what... What makes those voice? Because you talked about at the beginning of the segment that like the that small percentage of turfs are the loudest and most annoying. What mm-hmm. makes those people loud is the engagement that they receive. Mm-hmm. If that post about how trans people deserve to die gets zero likes or gets light gets let's say a hundred likes and three reblogs, guess how many people see it? A mm-hmm. hundred. That's it. Now, if all of a sudden everyone is reblogging it to sit there and be like, no, how dare you? This is so transphobic. This is so this. You're a terrible person. Like all the things that are justified and true about someone who would type, who would post that thing. But then all of a sudden that message gets spread. Mm-hmm. That person seems louder. You have given a microphone to a person who's shouting into the void. Uh, and that's that's like like a lesson on Internet in general. 
Yeah, I think something needs to reach a certain level of engagement before it's appropriate to start like debunking it. Yes. Because until it reaches a certain level of engagement, you're debunking it is just kind of like um, drawing a spotlight to it. But I do think there's a certain level, like once it receives a certain Absolutely. level of engagement, it should be debunked, you know? And, it, and, and that level of debunkness should be as minimal energy as possible. Yeah. Because the more energy you put into it, the more fire fuel to the gasoline. Yeah, right. and, it, and it is and that, tough because it takes way more words and way more time to debunk mm-hmm. it than the original claim. But yes, but like it's still and, it's still something to consider. And then remember that your job is not to change the person who posts its mind. It's to change the person who's going to be scrolling on Twitter, who sees this thing, goes into the sees that it has a million reblogs or whatever, goes into the comments and sees a link, sees an mm-hmm. argument, sees something that is not about being angry at the person who posted it but it's about educating the person who will eventually read it Mm -hmm. exactly so i think that that kind of covers like the current harry potter fandom but there is also a fandom that's coming up so a lot of people that are around my age i'm 36 by the way um have kids right and and if you are my age then you grew up with harry potter like quite literally you know you you are kind of the cutoff of uh of of, uh, of all of this stuff right like you're the ones that the letters burned so that you can't get into hogwarts you know what i mean um so a lot of us are reading harry potter to our kids having our kids watch the harry potter movies you know and exposing them to it and a lot of people are doing this without even knowing everything that's going on with jk rowling and, and the anti-trans stuff and things like that so a lot of people they're they're kind of like as they're rereading Harry Potter to their kids and stuff, re-experiencing it for the first time in a really long time. And so we have a lot of like kids, like single digit age kids that are kind of this new little wave of Harry Potter fandom. And they're not online quite yet, but I see them coming because I see all my coworkers' kids and my friends' kids and all of and all of this stuff. And like one of my coworkers, for example, who is a young Gen Xer, she's a little bit um a little bit older than me, but not not by too much. And so she's got single digit age kids. And all of a sudden her daughter thing is really, really into Hermione. And she's like, you know what? I never really pushed Harry Potter as like a main thing for them to be into because she's not super into Harry Potter. She's a little, a little bit older than me, older enough that Harry Potter was kid stuff for her, right? But um, so all of a sudden her kid's like really into into Hermione. And so she's like, you know, showing her more Harry Potter stuff and get it because you want to encourage what your kids are into. You know what I mean? So So there's a lot of this going on. And I am really curious how when these kids get to be like teenager age and they start getting onto social media more and more, what it's going to be like in the Harry Potter fandom with this new wave of children again. Very I think curious. I think it's really dependent on how um, people, how the, how the wizarding world is going to try to engage with them. Mm-hmm. Because I, I know that you said earlier that you don't think like, obviously there's not going to be another fantastic beast movie. But I disagree with the idea that there isn't ever going to be another spinoff movie because I don't think Fantastic Beasts flopped or the studio considers Fantastic Beasts a flop. I think the studio, because it still made money, this most recent movie still still netted positive, especially in a post-COVID movie release. Um, I think that another movie is going to come out. Uh, because I think that the people know that they need to. <laughs> Sorry, I just saw the anime. Uh, I think I'm typing the... a comment. <laughs> I think that uh, Warner Brothers knows that they need to grab the attention of these young teens. Oh, yeah. That's why I think like a Harry Potter remake is potential within the next decade for a Harry- for a remake to start. You know? I actually think it's too soon for a remake. I think it's very too soon for a remake, but I think so the executives think that remake, will think that it's time. <laughs> I don't I, I disagree with that because just looking at when remakes are getting made, it's about 30 years out, right? Mm-hmm. So I think we probably have another 15 years before a remake is so, so you think 15, um, not 10? Because in my mind I'm thinking like 10. Fi- I'm thinking 15 to 20. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um until uh I don't think a cartoon remake. You know what I think? I think it's going to be a CW spinoff or a tv show on netflix i could um, see a netflix remake or, um, I or some see... sort of 
or yeah. some sort of thing. And I don't necessarily think it's going to be a remake with the Harry Potter. I think it's going to be Marauders. It's going to be the next generation. It's going to be something that is different from Harry Potter because the movies are still relevant. Mm. I think as soon as the movies become unwatchable, which will happen in the next 10 years, that's when they'll start thinking about making new remake of movies. Yeah. Oh my um, god. Now I'm just thinking about though like a, a Krokonobosuke style anime, but it's Quidditch. That would be amazing. I can't stop thinking about it now. Thank you, Rar. I'm <laughs> listen, I don't know. I this is like one of the few animes I've seen, but the oh my gosh, what is the figure ice one that everyone was obsessed Yuri on with? Ice. Yuri, Yuri on ice. ice. Uh I, I just imagine a Yuri on Ice sort of but style, Quidditch. but Quidditch. Uh and oh I god, yes. the girlies will go crazy over that. I would watch that. Um, watch that but i think that that is going to be what they have to do in order to engage the next generation Mm -hmm. um because the next generation or this current generation is going to get to a point where especially with how their attention spans are that the old movies and the books are not enough Mm-hmm. What they, like, made they drag, us, you know? Well, what and they're not even they drag. I think what made Harry Potter so fundamental for us was the length of time it took throughout our childhood. Yeah, Harry Potter started in my second grade and ended senior year for mm-hmm. me. Mm-hmm. Like so that is wait. a huge <laughs> spread of time. Yep. Um, and that's the that's the movies. So that's my entire childhood. For you, very similar. It was yep. a long time of these childhoods, which is why it was so interwoven with our lives. If they don't have that, if they're capable of reading all the books and seeing all the movies within a year and a half, there that's not longevity there. Yeah. And let's be real, you can do it way faster. The only reason it took us that long is because we didn't want to be like, I, I still want to be a variety podcast. And also because I read really slow and like we well, want to analyze I, it. So if you're just I was also thinking for enjoyment. Well, I was know. also thinking at the like that's an appropriate age for 12, 13 year old to read seven books at that speed in a year and a half. That's like a that's like a reasonable oh, cool. that's a reasonable amount. So oh, okay. So that like maybe some kids will do it faster, maybe some kids will do it slower. But that that was what I was thinking as far as mm. like that's the chunk of time that it might take up in a kid's life is one to two years, maybe. Yeah. And then and it's just very different for us when you have to wait for the books and the Harry Potter kind of grows up with you. It's a very different experience. Exactly. Um, so they need something in order to like hook that in and have that attention. Uh, because other fandoms have done that. Think of Mm -hmm. Star Wars. Mm -hmm. Star Wars did it. Episode. Obviously, that this was planned, but episode four, five, and six. Is that what it was? Um, Was one generation. Mm -hmm. One, two, and three was the early 2000s. It was like our generation. Our generation. And then you have the next generation with uh, the three movies plus all the Disney plus shit that's coming out now, too. Mm -hmm. Emphasis on Um, the shit. And has engaged and and had that longevity of spreading out through generations for the purpose of grabbing the attention of each generation. We'll mm-hmm. be very honest, the most recent trilogy for Star Wars was not for the original fans because it's the same exact plot line. It was to grab the attention of modern fans mm-hmm. um, to get them to fall in love with the story. Yep. Yep. Now we now Star Wars. That's a whole thing we could go and do. Did it work or not? Like, um, not really. Yes. Like the most recent stuff is not for is really didn't grab anyone's attention. Nobody really cares. Um, the only thing people care about is Raylo. Uh, from that. So, <laughs> but generationally speaking, but, but, that but is you a understand. fandom that has survived time. Yeah, but right? you understand like, like what they what they were doing, the marketing of it, like why they did it that way, right? Yeah. That that makes sense. Star so, Trek yeah. is another example of that. Whether it worked mm-hmm. or not. Who knows? Yeah, and and, and some, mm-hmm. and some um some Star Trek series are better than others, right? Mm-hmm. But they're doing the same thing. They keep it going with a new series to capture a new audience, as well as welcome back the existing people. <laughs> da 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 da. Exactly. It gave little yeah. girls a Halloween costume. Yes, it did. Yes, it, it did. did. <laughs> uh, Lord That's of true. the Rings being another example, as far as like, oh, the books really hooked them in, and then you had the original Hobbit, and then you had the movies. 
And then you have the remake of The Hobbit. And now you have the TV show. Mm -hmm. There is this continually trying to hook different generations in. And it's not because like this most recent TV show has grown with the a, the people of the original fandom of the original books. That's not who the audience was. The audience for this TV show was the people who liked the Hobbit movie and also their kids. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So we've got the same same situation with Harry Potter. I, I agree that there will be some kind of new Harry Potter content for these kids. Um, I, I think it's much sooner rather than, than later. Um, uh, whatever that is, though, whether it's a remake or whatever... Um, I do think that that it's it's really interesting. Harry Potter had so much potential to be like a really long term fandom that just lasted and lasted and lasted like Star Trek. You know, just Star Trek fandom has been around forever. And the fandom aspect of Star Trek has been a big part of that show for a long time. And I feel like Harry Potter has that potential. Um, and J.K. Rowling is just squandering it left, right, and center, because I don't know if Harry Potter is good enough to compete with her nonsense. I I just, when I look at Harry Potter and we've reanalyzed it as adults, it, it is, and Fantastic Beasts has kind of proved this, it is very hard to write something, Harry Potter, that is appropriate for adult engagement. And yet... <laughs> They have to make something that has broad appeal to everybody, not just kids, to have that long-staying fandom that persists and persists and persists through generations. So I almost feel like Harry Potter has the potential to fade out and not be one of these long-standing fandoms like we thought it would be for forever and ever. And the only thing that I think that exists that could make it last is the fact that it has some pretty damn good theme parks. Honestly, I think that's that's the thing that might make it stay around, but I am skeptical if it will stay. I think it will. Um I think that the reality is is that like as much as we want to talk about how much Fantastic Beasts flopped because it did. I think that outside of the diehard fans, people will look into it four or three years from now and go, oh, the reason it flopped was because of COVID. The reason it flopped was because of the Johnny Depp debacle. The reason it flopped, like they'll forget. The distance will make them forget for this thing. I think that the fandom will survive if the next thing is successful. If the next thing is not successful, then it's dead. That's the that's the that's the nail. You think in the they have coffin. one more chance? You think they have one? I more think chance. they. I think they have one more chance. I think five five years from now, three to five years from now, there is going to be either another movie or there will be a TV show made, and that will be the last chance because that will hook in the nostalgia of the people who are not necessarily diehard fans but still have a lot of nostalgia from the Harry Potter series. The kids will be of the right age to be able to engage in it um, to the level of what, uh, uh, to a level that it can be directed towards both adults and children. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that it will be the right time. I think it's very interesting because for Warner brothers to keep hold of the copyright, they got to make something. So, What the heck is that thing going to be? Because if they don't make something, then eventually you lose the copyright. Now, it takes a while, but that's part of why the Spider-Man franchise, for example, has gone through all the craziness that it went through, where they they keep making a new Spider-Man trilogy, you know, every so often, is to keep the copyright. It's to keep the copyright. So Warner Brothers is going to have to make a Harry Potter movie TV something to keep the copyright and i think really curious what that'll be yeah it'll be it'll be interesting to see what it is um a part of me really hopes that it's not a remake this early again because i think the movies are still watchable i don't technology has certainly gone above and beyond but it hasn't gone enough to make such a huge difference in graphics for these for these movies especially the later ones you know what actually makes it look old to me now? It has nothing to do with the technology of how it was filmed, but it's honestly like 
the makeup. Yes. The makeup no, and hair in those movies looks like really dated. <laughs> it's it's cringy how mm-hmm. like how 90s and to early 2000s the hair and the and the clothing and the costuming, especially mm-hmm. the out of robes costuming mm-hmm, mm-hmm, is mm-hmm. um it's incredibly it's incredibly it's early 2000s. Yeah. Um and that's what makes it feel dated. So yeah, I agree with you as far like I I don't think I think that there won't be a remake made until the technology is there to really make it something different. Well, we'll see. Um, we'll, we'll see. see. We uh, we ha- we don't know that any new Harry Potter content is coming that we would want to cover. Um, we have no plans to do it. I I really want like at this moment. I really want to leave Harry Potter behind us after the Fantastic Beasts episode. So we're not going to talk about it outside of that one episode in um in 2023. Like, it's not going to be the focus. If it comes mm-hmm. up, it'll come up as an aside, kind of like, you know, when we're talking about Harry Potter, certain other things come up as asides, right? Um, But, uh, you know... Maybe if, for, if, maybe for like, a 500 follower thing, we'll maybe. do Curse, Curse Child or something <laughs> yeah. like that. But Yeah, maybe. But, like, that's the only other piece of Harry Potter content that we have no plans to cover, and we don't have plans to cover it. So I will be really curious, you know, if we're still doing this podcast and then in a piece of Harry Potter Potter content, new new Harry Potter content drops, um, what we decide to do. But at this moment, I am really feeling like excited and energized to talk about something else. <laughs> I'm ready for the Hunger Games. <laughs> yes, I'm ready for Hunger Games. I don't have nearly I just don't have the the complicated feelings about Hunger Games. Like in my mind, Hunger Games um, I, I think I'm going to go in and feel pretty similar to how I felt when I originally read it, but we'll see. I think it'll be a nice palate cleanser yes. to go into something that's so completely aware of the purpose that it's writing for. Yes. Yes. Amazing timer for you moving to the Hunger Games of the New Year. Exactly. New Year, New Year, New Us. We did it on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. New, new Year, New Inner Stage Window. Yeah. No. Okay. So I will tell you guys. Um, for those of y'all that did my survey that I posted a couple weeks ago, thank you so much. You have helped me a lot with deciding uh, content for the next year. But for those of you that didn't didn't do it, you don't know. We're, I'm gonna get, we're gonna do right now. I'm gonna give you a little preview of what we're gonna be covering next year, so you know what to look forward to. In addition to Hunger Games, um, I told you about that, and I told you about how we're gonna do for our musical episode last five years. Um, but as you know, another thing that we like to do is the the weebification of Landon. We are going to make Landon understand why anime is good and a decent medium to engage with, not just like the random five shows that she's seen. Okay. So part as part of the weebification of Landon, we are also going to be watching Death Note. Um, I cannot wait to show Landon Death Note. She has only, you've only seen like the Netflix live action remake, right? Yes. Okay. All right. Welcome in Alpha Tip. How are you doing today? Uh, yes. Okay. I also, so... I also know about Death. Like I'm not, I haven't read it or watched it but i know about it yeah you know the you know the broad strokes of the story right like yes. you kind of know what's in there right yeah, um, yes yes blank space by taylor swift hmm? i'm not sure what that means can you ask your question a different way i'm not sure what you're saying lunar i'm sorry oh, but that's a song yes that's a taylor song. Swift. yeah i don't know that i know enough about music to ever I do song analysis Baby, I could do a Taylor Swift analysis. That would be a <laughs> lot of fun. Maybe oh, if we ever my had a god. Only episode. I'm just saying though, Taylor. Oh my god! Can, if we we're gonna do the Weebo vacation of Landon, can we do the Taylor Swift fanning of Karen <laughs> Terry? Um, I'm not opposed. I'm not opposed. I just don't know enough about music. I think to have interesting critiques. Mm. So that's fine. Yeah. It's a song people oh, say is related to blank Death space Note. Because oh, I'll write, I'll write I your name because you. you write you. the name. I got you because you write okay. the name and the person and the dying and the thing. I don't know it's why. Not- why didn't I make that connection when you when you said it? Oh, whatever, Lunar. I don't. I don't know. Um. So yeah. So that that is that is kind of the main things that we're doing next year. In addition to that, um, our Disney movie next year is going to be The Little Mermaid. Yes. We are going to watch the new Little Mermaid, and we're going to do a comparison. It. Yeah, just like we did for Mulan, we're going to do the original cartoon compared to the the live action remake. Um, there's so much zeitgeist controversy around this because of the casting choices, and I can't wait to see how it actually comes together. I I'm, I I have I have hopes, 
I have yeah. hopes, but not high hopes. So we will I have, see. <laughs> I have hopes, and I think it's mostly because of Lin Manuel Miranda. I'm like, man, if he's involved, you know, and Ariel's black, there might be some good things happening. You know, there's going to be some earwigs. I mean, I, 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 mm, I love the songs in Encanto, even though I had less serious issues with it in Encanto. Anyways, um, Lin Manuel Miranda inspires like such annoyance and, you did, and, and you positivity did like the, at the same time. Yeah, you did like some of the songs in Hamilton, even if you did like Hamilton. <laughs> My favorite, least favorite musical in the world is Hamilton, as you guys know from the Hamilton episode. Anyways, I hate how much Lin Manuel Miranda makes me like him. <laughs> um. So yeah, so so that's what's coming for next year. Um, and this closes the chapter on on Harry Potter. Landon, any last comments before we kind of uh, wrap up the podcast segment of today's stream? About Harry Potter? No, or, yeah. but I have nothing else to say about Harry Potter other than I, listen, I will always be a Slytherin. It's tattooed on my body, but it's not everything about me. We're growing. I understand. Yeah, uh, we can say like we... this was our ha- this was the house when we were kids, and now we're adults. And now we're you know? adults. Yeah. Uh, but before we wrap up completely, I would love to give a book update. My because yes. I started this year talking about my goals was to keep track of all of my books. Yes. How much have you read this year, Landon? Oh my goodness gracious! All right. So, I split my reading specifically into traditionally published novels and fan fiction and my goal at the beginning of the year was to have a hundred stories or a hundred average books read between the two of those uh well good news is i'm well over a hundred by this point so i have read in thank you so much (laughs) i have read in total uh 324 stories which averages out, if you count a book to be about 400 pages, it averages out to about 150 books. Uh, I am at 89 traditionally published books, which means I have, I'm so close, which means I have made the goal for the rest of December to get those final 11 novels uh, read by the end of this month. So that the 17th, I can... you're going to have to pick some short ones, friend. <laughs> uh, no, because I started this month with needing to read 25. So I've already re- re- read 14 novels this month. Wow. Um, <laughs> so we're trying. But in case anyone wants to know, I read 500, I have read 59,630 pages. Um, and of fan fiction, I read over 7 million words of fan fiction. Jesus Christ. I have the whole, I have pie charts for favorite ships, for fandoms, for, uh, what, what genre, or for what level of rating, uh, for authors, all that fun stuff too. So I might, I might do a Google, I have a, I have a Google slides, but I might publish one just in case anyone wants to see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Whatever you're comfortable I, with sharing the data of, you should put it in the Discord. My fun stuff in the in the Discord because it's a lot. I am in awe. I am in awe, you guys. Y'all, I have such smart friends. Like, that's a lot of words, Landon. That's crazy. This is so many words. Um, My highest reading, I read 24 books last month. So just... That was just last month? Last month was my highest, was my highest book count month. <laughs> all right well as that is said then i will because i know that you you continue to stream after yes these but, days, but we'll, so. we'll close out this one so okay all right landon where can everybody find you you can find me at land in maine at uh it, oh my god i was gonna say land in maine.com which is not true you can find <laughs> me on instagram at land in maine and also twitter at land in maine and also on the Discord, if you want to say hi to me there, I'll probably uh, do a fun little book wrapped, 2022 wrapped up as we approach the end of the year. Mm-hmm. So you can see uh, more information about all the books that I've read this year. Yes. And we want to say also um, a big get well soon to Landon. Thank I you. I hope you are get well this week so that you can have fun on your cruise. 
Thank um, you. So so after this, she's going to go get lots of rest for this weekend. <laughs> I'm going to go COVID sleep. <laughs> yes, I'm going to go take a COVID test and I'm going to go sleep. Yes. Yep. All right. So where can you find me? You can find me in all the places. Um, you can find me on YouTube. That's where I post all my VODs. You can find me right here on the uh, Twitch. So if you really liked what we did today, we do this a lot of Saturdays, so you should definitely follow. Also, um, Twitter is my main social media until Ermine Muskrat kills it, which he is well on his way to doing. So you can follow me there. That's where all the latest updates go. And you can join the Discord. And the reason to join the Discord is because I control the notifications there. So you're going to get all the notifications for when we go live and when uh, when VODs go up on YouTube and all that sort of stuff. And they're a lot more reliably than trusting YouTube and um, and Twitch. Also, you can support us in all the ways. Um, so because we're on Twitch, subs and bits is the easiest way. But I also do have a tip jar and I also have a merch store if you're interested in that, as well as a throne wish list. If you would like to buy me a Christmas present, you're more than welcome to. There's all kinds of price ranges on there. If that interests you, you are welcome to do that. All right. That is it for our um, podcast segment of the stream today. When we come back, we are going to be doing our Sims 2 Legacy. So um, for that, well, let's say bye to YouTube first, and I've got a couple more things to say. All right. Thank you so much for watching. And of course, as always, don't forget to make it a great day. And don't forget to be awesome. All right. Bye, YouTube.